no way a lot of room in here tonight. It's probably just me. Mainly me. Um, so, uh, in, in typical Kami fashion, uh, I gave very little thought as to what I was actually going to do tonight until uh, yesterday when people started prompting on Facebook to ask what the, what the talk was going to be on. To be honest with you, I hadn't much of a clue. So, uh, you know, we'll wait and see how it turns out. But I, I decided, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, when I first walked into this lodge room, my interest was piqued by the various different gilded figures that stand around us. And I thought, I had a fair idea, you know, I thought, you know, Greek illusion and what have you. Uh, and I thought, yeah, I, I think I know who these are. Uh, so I went away and did a little bit of research last night and I've, 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 I've managed to work out exactly who it was. Now, there was what one wee curveball was thrown me. Uh, and, I'll, I, and I'll get to that in a minute. But when the master says to us, uh, you know, about doing a paper tonight, uh, he said, why don't you do Burns? And Burns is nice and safe for me. I can, I can do Burns no problem at all. Uh, but sometimes it's nice to get a wee bit out of your comfort zone. But it's, it's not good to totally ignore your master's dicta. So I'm going to start with a little bit, <laughs> a little bit of Burns, just to sort of, uh, you know, to get things, to get things going. Oh, where I on Parnassus Hill, or had O Helic on my fill, that I might catch poetic skill to sing how much I love thee. You've got a wee bit more of that later on. But this speaks to the, to, to the heart of what we're going to talk about. Where's Parnassus? Parnassus is uh, one of a, a mountain range in the middle of Greece. There's a few of them that vie for being the, the homes of the gods because they disappear up into the clouds. And Parnassus is one of them. Mount Helicon is another one. Obviously, Mount Olympus is possibly the most famous of these. Uh, Parnassus is used in various different, uh, different places in Greek mythology. In some versions of the Greek flood myth, uh, it's where Deucalion's Ark came to rest at the end of the 40 days flood. Yes, that happens in Greek mythology too. And uh, Deucalion's Ark comes to rest on the top of, uh, of Parnassus. That's the, the verse of the myth. If you, you can go and look that up in Ovid's Metamorphoses if you're, if you're particularly interested. Orestes uh, spent a, a bit of time hiding up in uh, up on Mount Parnassus, and of course you all know who Orestes is. Uh, he was uh, the son of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, and I can see you all nodding sagely now. <laughs> Agamemnon was, was one, of the, one of the two protagonists at the Trojan War, and uh, at the end of that, Agamemnon was in for a bit of a sticky end, and Clytemnestra, his wife, uh, she'd been having a, a bit of a fling on the side, and when he got back to uh, back to, to Mycenae, uh, he was slain by uh, his, his wife's lover, and uh, Orestes had to, had to go and do one for a short period of time, and, and, and he hid up on uh, Mount Parnassus. It was also sacred to the, to the god Dionysus. Dionysus is properly the god of the fest aboard. He is, uh, he's the, he's the, the drinking god, the Bacchus of, of, of uh, Roman uh, mythology. That's who Dionysus is. Um, and in Book 19 of the, of the Odyssey, uh, Odysseus uh, tells the story of how he was gored uh, in his thigh in a, in a boar hunt up on Mount Parnassus. It was also the home of Pegasus. Pegasus, I'm in fairly kind of uh, happy ground there. I, I guess you all know who Pegasus is. <laughs> of course, he was the horse of uh, Belephorin. You knew that too. No doubt. <laughs> Uh, but more to the point for us here, it was where we would find the, cor the, the Coruscian uh, cave located on, on the slopes of Mount Parnassus. And that was, it was sacred to, to the god Pan, but more particularly to the Muses. From the Heliconian Muses, let us begin to sing who hold the great and holy mount of Helicon and dance on soft feet about the deep blue spring and the altar of the almighty son of Kronos, and when they have washed their tender bodies in Parmesis, 
when the horses spring, or all, all meers make their fair lovely dances upon highest helicon and move with vigorous feet. These are the muses. And Burns, again, when he's writing uh, back to the, the blind poet, uh, Dr. Thomas Blacklock, who stayed at the Pear Tree House, uh, he wrote a letter back to him after he'd moved down to Dumfriesshire, and he was telling him about how uh, he, had, he had joined the exiles, and he was awfully concerned that the muse was going to leave him. He says, Parnation Quines, I fear, I fear you'll now disdain me, and then my fifty pounds a year will little gain me, ye glee gleesome, dainty dames, wobby Castilia's wimpling streamies, loup, sing, and lave your pretty limmies. Lave your pretty limmies, wash your legs, wash your, wash your hands and feet. And Castilia's bum is where the, the visitors to the Delphi Oracle would go to wash themselves before they, they, they went to find out exactly what was in store for them. It was where the Pythian Games contestants would be before and after their matches, where uh, pilgrims to the Delphi uh, Oracle, uh, they, would, they would have to make sure that they were ritually clean before they, before they took it. And Pythia and the priests themselves would cleanse themselves before they uh, started diving open doves and what have you to tell them what, uh, what, was, in, what was in store for them. Roman poets, uh, in particular, the, even the likes of Ovid and what have you, regarded um, Castilian's uh, fountain as being a, a great source of poetic inspiration. And so this, you know, passed right down through, um, I guess, you know, Greek mythology f fell out of, fell out of favour, I guess, with the fall of uh, Constantinople. Uh, and for the next 500 years or so, we talk about Rome a great deal, we don't talk about Greece much at all. But in Scotland, we are quite quick on the uptake, and uh, James VI of Scots uh, would form a, a band of poets around him, uh, and he called them the, the Castilian Band, uh, uh, incorporating the king himself, and people like Alexander Montgomery and Patrick Hume of Polworth. And, uh, these two guys had a flighting contest with one another. Do you know what flighting is? You, almost all, I can guarantee you, uh, indulge in flighting all the time. But it's, it, it's quite a peculiarly Scottish thing. Uh, I think, I, I often tell my clients when they, when they visit from the States, you never really trust someone properly in Scotland until they're comfortable to rip the utter pish out of you. <laughs> it's very important it's done to your face, you know, there's never any, never any hurt meant by it, but that is flighting, that's exactly what flighting is, and it has a, a long and glorious, even regal past here in Scotland. So that's the Castilian band. So, to the muses themselves, uh, during the Enlightenment, we formed something of a cult, of, of these individuals, the muses, you know, again, once we're rediscovering uh, Grecian uh, literature in particular. And one of the earliest lodges in Paris was called Les Neuf Sœurs. Voltaire belonged to it, Benjamin Franklin belonged to it, Danton belonged to it. Many of the Enlightenment figures would visit and uh, they, they would be in the company of the muses that you see around here. Um, museum itself originally meant, meant the cult place of the muses. It's where we get music from, general musings, amusements. All of this comes from, from the muses. So who were they? Well, Greek mythology is, is rather fluid. There was no Nicene council uh, in, Greek, so, uh, in Greek literature. So pr pretty much everyone held Homer to be the <coughs> defining central part of, of Grecian literature. But other people would have favourites in the likes of Pindar or Sappho or uh, you know, Sophocles, uh, Euripides. And they would all tell quite different versions of the same story. So there, there's a real fluidity uh, to Grecian mythology. Uh, but most sources their father is held to be Zeus, 
And in the, the piece of, uh, of, of poetry that I read you out there, he is the great son of Kronos. Kronos is the is, um, father time, essentially. You know, uh, the figure that we think of with the, you know, with the scythe and, the, and the, the hooded cowl and what have you. This is Kronos. And Kronos was, was a titan, not a god. So he was... Uh, the, uh, the titans actually came, came before, the, before the gods. And at one stage, Zeus was married to, uh, not at one stage, Zeus was always married to Hera, who was the queen of the goddesses that you find in Olympia. But he was a bit of a, he was a bit of a lad, was Zeus. You know, he, he was very difficult to, to tie down. And there was a ten-year war between the Titans and the gods. And halfway through this war, Zeus still managed to find time to go away and jolly himself with one of the Titanesses, and her name was Mnemosyne. Mnemosyne. And when you talk about mnemonics and, and, and what have you, this all comes from this. Mnemosyne. There's a, there's a silent M at the start of that. That's what makes it particularly difficult. M, M, and then all the rest of it. Mnemosyne is, is, the, is the, the, uh, the mother of memory if you like. So Zeus lies with Mnemosyne, and between themselves they father nine nymphs. And they've got ten figures around the room here. That's the wee curveball, you see. So who are they? Well, I think the firstborn is Calliope, and uh, she, is, she is the muse of epic poetry. And I think that this is Calliope here. It's very difficult to tell because they don't all have the attributes that you would expect them to have. Calliope uh, should wear some sort of crown, but she, she most commonly uh, picks up with a stylus or something like that. She doesn't have one. But I think that this, I think that this here is, is Calliope. Cleo, uh, she is the muse of history. Now, they're not in order around the, around the wall here, brethren. I'm not entirely certain which one is Cleo, but I'm going to guess the one at the back there. Uh, because I can't think of any other particular reason why she would have a dolphin. None of the rest of the muses are at all uh, interested in, in the sea. And Cleo uh, is supposed to have had some sort of dalliance with Poseidon. So I think that's Cleo, most likely. Euterpe is the, uh, is the muse of... of song and music and at a guess I would say that Euterpe is one of these two but which one I'm not entirely certain is they're almost identical those two particular ladies she is she is. and there is a muse of dance but the muse of dance <coughs> is normally pictured sitting down the muse of dance is Tepsikri She's normally pictured sitting down, but none of these are sitting down. I'm going to guess that one of these is Terpsichore and the other one uh, is Euterpe. Arato is the, the muse of love poetry. Melpomene, I'm pretty sure, is this lady here, uh, who is the muse of tragedy. And normally she has some sort of militaria around her. Typically it would be like a sword or a club or something like that. Here uh, we have a shield. Uh, so I'm guessing that that one there is Melpomene. Polyhymnia uh, is an agricultural goddess as well as being uh, the goddess of um, <coughs> hymns, unsurprisingly. Polyhymnia means many hymns. And there's a few of the characters around here have grapes. Not this one, I don't think. But there's yeah, one or two of them. Polyhymnia, uh, certainly, you know, there was, there was a, a sacred attribute to, uh, to uh, Greek hymns as well. They would dance them as well as singing. Uh, Terpsichore, I've already mentioned. Thalia is the goddess of comedy. And odd as it may seem, I think that this is Thalia here, above the senior warden's uh, chair. Um, the reason I say that is because she has buskins on her feet. 
and these are like uh, stage boots. So I think that that's most likely her. The last one is Urania. And Urania, I'm almost certain, is this lady. Quite different to all the rest of them. She's veiled. Uh, typically she would be cut, uh, you know, pictured with a globe and a compass, which you would think would be something that you would have in it, anyway, <laughs> if you were going to have it anyway. But just to go into a little bit more, more depth as to, as to who the various different ones are, Calliope will begin with. Her name means beautiful voice. And she had two famous sons, one of whom was called Lydus, not quite so famous. The other one, I guess you've probably heard of, Orpheus. And I, I don't think it's a, a surprise to find that if you went to a fairground, there are two different organs that you're likely to find. One of them is called the Orpheus, and the other one is called the Calliope. Orpheus, if you haven't heard of him, you'll certainly know a piece of music that was written about. Uh, Jacques Offenbach wrote a piece of music called Orpheus in the Underworld. And there is a gallop from that that I can almost guarantee that everyone in the house knows. You just don't know you know it. It goes... Orpheus in the Calliope is supposed to have been the wisest of the muses and also uh, the most assertive, in, uh, you know, in, uh, according to Hesiod. Hesiod uh, was probably uh, of a comparative age to Homer, we're looking at about 700 years BC or so, fairly early on. And, in terms of, of Greek writing, uh, and Hesiod is, is the first one to really sort of uh, solidify the, the, the pantheon of the muses. She defeated, along with the rest of along with the rest of her sisters, the daughters of Pieris, who was a king of Thessaly, in a singing match. And to uh, you know, because they thought that they could beat the muses at singing, um, she got a little, a little bit of a hissy fit and turned them all into magpies. So when you, when you, do you know what's odd? There are no magpies in, in North America. Did you know that? It's not something I was aware of. But almost every client that I have come across from the states, when they see a magpie for the first time, well, what's that? And sometimes they'll, 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 they'll ask you about things that you don't even see what it is they're asking you because it's so common to you. You know, no magpies in North America. Most odd. I guess that uh, it's too. Too much of a flight from Thessaly, that's my guess. But um, <laughs> Calliope was, was believed to be Homer's muse when he was writing the, the, the Aenid and later on uh, the Odyssey, uh, the Iliad, sorry, the Odyssey. And Virgil invokes her uh, in the Aenid. Uh, Virgil being the, the, the Roman equivalent almost of, of Homer. Um, the next one is Cleo. And her name literally means make famous. Uh, she's a proclamatory uh, individual. So if you drive a Renault Clio, then you, you know that you're driving about a famous car. Uh, she had one son, apparently, or she may have had up to three, uh, but one of her sons is called Hyacinth. It's strange to think of Hyacinth as a, as a man's name. Uh, but Hyacinth was originally uh, a bloke and uh, he was a lover of Apollo, Apollo being one of the Greek gods. Uh, but he was also fancied by one of the goddesses, or one of the nymphs I should say, and she, uh, Apollo and, and Hyacinth were having a, a discus competition and she, she toyed with the discus and made a hit. Hyacinth in the back of the head and knocked him <coughs> stone dead. Apollo thought this was a very wrong do indeed. Uh, possibly the, the mother of Hymenaeus, who was a wedding deity. Possibly the mother of Linus, who is also claimed by Calliope. But uh, this depends on whose book you're reading. Uh, Euterpe, I told you, is the, the muse of music. And I think we decided that that was going to be Euterpe, didn't we? Because the other one was going to be Terpsichore. She's the giver of delight. 
And she does look as if she would give you some delight. To, uh, to. Well, she, she invented the aulos, which is a double flute. Uh, something like a, 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 almost like a bagpipe with no bag. So you have a, a, you know, one pipe that plays a drone and another one that plays a melody. Supposed to be a bit of a peasant instrument, the, the, the upper crust Greeks preferred the lyre, uh, which gives its name to lyric poetry and so forth. But uh, the aulos, more of a uh, more of a shepherd's tool. Also apparently the mother of Rhesus, you tell me. And uh, uh, whether Rhesus gave his name to, to blood types or monkeys, I've, I've got no idea. To do more. more research on that. Erato is the, the goddess of, of love and lyric poetry. She morphs into flora in, in Roman literature. So I think this is probably uh, Erato across here, which is kind of strange because she's got more clothes on than some, some of the rest of them. But, uh, you know, to me, she seems something more alluring. Oddly enough, um, Erato is, is often featured holding an ear of corn because her name means to flourish. So, uh, again, why we don't have that in a Masonic Lodge, I think that would be a great thing to add, uh, if anyone's got some mould in clay. Uh, she was the grandmother of Asclepius, who was the, the, the father of medicine, through Cleophema and Coronis, so I'm told by Wikipedia. And uh, then we move on to Melpomene, and although Melpomene means, uh, you know, she is the muse of tragedy, uh, her, her name actually means celebrate with song. Tragedy and comedy are quite different to what, we, what we've come to, to think of them as now. Uh, tragic in, uh, in Greek art doesn't necessarily mean to say uh, that something dreadful is going to happen. Almost always it does. But that's not what the, what the tragedy aims to do. It's a foil to comedy. Comedy aims to point out error. All good comedy should point out error. Uh, it's no good for it just to give you a belly laugh. It has to, has to have actually a moral purpose. And the same with, the same with tragedy, but without this pointing out of the error. Uh, now, Pomeroy represented the chorus, uh, and she also wore uh, these boots that you can see on her feet here. Corinthus, they were called in, in Greek. And the idea of them was that they gave you uh, added height on the stage to give you a little bit more presence. I think Tom Cruise still wears them now. <laughs> uh, Polyhymnia is the muse of the, the sacred arts. By dint of, of trying to work out which ones we haven't covered yet, this could well be Polly Hermia across here. She always looks pens, pensive, uh, kind of thoughtful. She's often pictured with a, with, you know, with a finger up to, uh, up to her face like this. And, you know, I can see something of that here. Uh, oddly enough, also the goddess of agriculture, of meditation, of pantomime and of geometry, which is a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, but geometry, again, uh, you know, you can see why, you know, why we would be uh, uh, picturing these uh, these deities in the, in the lodge here. She also may have been the mother of Orpheus. Again, it depends uh, who you're talking about. Now, Tepsichore, uh, as well as being the mother of Sirens, I do, who remembers the cheese shop sketch? Uh, in Monty Python, not as famous as the as the parrot sketch, uh, but very similar, quite similar. You have John Cleese playing the, playing the aggrieved customer, and he has to curtail his wall polling activities at the local library because he's feeling somewhat peckish and uh, wants to consume some cheesy comestibles and takes himself to uh, Henry Wensleydale's cheese shop only to discover that he's got no cheese and eventually shoots him in the head. But uh, <laughs> when he walks in, he notices a sign just outside the door that says it's licensed for public dancing. And Eric Idol is playing a bazooki, whilst uh, Graham Chapman and Terry Jones are doing... Uh, all of these three guys are, are dressed in, in, in bowler hats and, and 
morning suits, you know, the, the, that classic kind of uh, Monty Python look. But they're doing something which is very clearly uh, like a Greek folk dance, the two of them, you know. And, uh, um, uh, Eric Idle's playing the bazooki, uh, and eventually they're told to shut up, you know, although John Cleese said that he was uh, a great imbiber of all forms of the Tapsicorean muse. And this is Tapsicorean that we're talking about. See, there's all sorts of levels in, in Monty Python. That you, you know, you, need, you really need a good classical education before you can fully, uh, fully understand it all. So, um, Thalia, uh, the muse of comedy, and as I said, I reckon this one here because it's the only other one that's wearing boots. And again, these are foils for one another. You know, comedy and tragedy, as well as music and dance. Uh, and I would say probably uh, Urania and uh, Polyhymnia are possibly foils for one another as well. Um, she, uh, again, uh, often pictured with an ear of corn, she also carries a shepherd's crook from time to time. And, uh, you know, in, in a vaudeville act, when someone's, you know, when you've had enough of a, a character and you yank them off the stage with a, with a hook, that's exactly where that comes from, from Thalia, the, the muse of comedy, off you get with the shepherd's hook. And Urania, just to come to the last one, is uh, the muse of astronomy, heavenly, her name means. She's also the muse of oratory, or, you know, the ability to speak fluently. Uh, she's seen as being uh, an emblem of, of universal love, uh, uh, the Greek version of the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit. And uh, you know, this is, this is Urania. So again, someone that's, that's, that's very definitely at, at home in a Masonic Lodge, evoked by uh, John Milton in Paradise Lost. He, you know, he's very keen to say that, uh, you know, he doesn't want to involve himself with, uh, you know, with something so profane as a Greek muse, but he certainly wants to use uh, her spirit in, uh, in writing uh, his great work. So, we haven't mentioned this one here, the 10th statue. And, you know, until I came here tonight, I really, I didn't have much of an idea who this was going to be. I had a, a few guesses. I thought it could be Mnemosyne, the mother. It's a possibility. Uh, it could be Sappho, uh, who, according to Plato, was the 10th new Sappho, uh, was an actual person in history, uh, unlike obviously all these goddesses here. Uh, but Sappho said that she was such a wonderful artist that she must be a tenth muse. So I thought, I thought that was a possibility. I thought that it could be Euphim who nursed the muses uh, down at the, at the foot of, of Mount Helicon. Uh, but in close inspection, this figure has no bosom. <coughs> This is the only bloke in the room. And so I'm almost certain that this is Apollo. Because Apollo was seen as uh, the patron of the arts and the patron of the muses. So again, really until I came here tonight, I had no idea who the 10th one was going to turn out to be. But I'm, I'm convinced that that's probably Apollo. Uh, I also had a whole list of the Olympian goddesses and it could have been could have been Hera, that we've already mentioned, and, you know, the, the wife of Zeus, it could have been Artemis. Uh, I thought at one stage that this might be Artemis because of the shield. Uh, I, th I thought that was a possibility. Athena, the uh, goddess of wisdom, or Aphrodite, you know, the, the, if any of you have been to, to Cyprus, no doubt you've seen where Aphrodite came out of the, came out of the foam, or you'll certainly be, be acquainted with the, you know, with the painting of her, of her appearance as she appears. Uh, in all her, in all her <laughs> glory. Hestia, who was the, the domestic goddess, or Demeter, who was the agriculture, you know, the proper Olympian agricultural goddess. Um, but as I say, I don't think it's any of these. I think it's most likely Apollo. So, I hope I've given you something at least to use upon when you're, uh, when you're looking around the walls. Uh, and I'll just, uh, I'll sing the rest of the song that I opened, opened the evening with. Uh, just by way of, of wrapping things up. Oh, were I on Parnassus Hill, or had O Helicon my fill, 
that I might catch poetic skill to sing how much I love thee. But if mun be my muse as well, my muse mun be your bonny shell. On course and con, I'll glower and spell and sing how much I love thee. So come, sweet muse, inspire my lay through all the lee lang summer's day. I canna sing, I canna say how much, how dear I love thee. I see thee dancing on the green, thy way say jump, thy limbs say clean. Thy tempting lips, thy roving in my heaven and earth, I love thee. By night, by day, by field at him, the thoughts of thee, my heart and flame, and I, I lisp and sing thy name, my only live to love. Though I were doomed to wander on Beyond the sea, beyond the sun Till my last weary sons were run Till then, and then, I love thee Thank you, Bill. Thank <laughs> you.